We're going to start our exploration into the topic of elasticity now. Elasticity measures the sensitivity of buyers, for example, uh, to changes in the price. That is, for example, if the price of gasoline were to double overnight, how, how dramatically would that affect buyers of gasoline? That is, how much would they cut back their purchases? We know with higher prices they'll buy less. The question now becomes, how much less? This is the question every seller asks himself when he considers, should I raise my price? If I raise my price this much, how many customers or how many sales will I lose? And so there's offsetting factors. He's getting a higher price for his product, but he's selling a smaller quantity. So now we're going to start quantifying that. Our first major elasticity we're going to look at, and we're going to look at this one in good depth, is examining what is the effect of price on buyers. If price changes, how do buyers behave? We measure this as the price elasticity of demand. There's my symbol for it, the little E sub D. Our second elasticity we're going to look at is the effect of prices on seller behavior, the price elasticity of supply. If prices go up, we know sellers will be inclined to produce more. We're just going to try to measure how much more. Next, we're going to look at the effect of income changes on buyer behavior. Uh, we know that with most goods, if incomes rise, people buy more products, more of the product, and if incomes fall, they buy less. But that's not always true. When we deal with inferior goods, we know that if incomes go up, people tend to buy less of, a, of an inferior good. So we're going to quantify this in a measurement called income elasticity, with a little Greek letter eta there that we'll use to symbolize that. And then finally, we're going to talk about the relationship between two goods. For example, if the price of Pepsi goes up, uh, how does that affect the sales of Coca-Cola? And not just will they go up or down, but how much will they increase or decrease? This measurement is called the cross price elasticity. A uh, little Greek letter sigma, V comma X, V and X represent the two goods we're examining. Sometimes they call this just the cross elasticity. It's the same idea. So let's, uh, let's take a look at what we'll, we'll call here the own price elasticity of demand. We're going to talk about the effect of the price uh, or a change of the price on buyer behavior. And we're going to, again, try to quantify this when we get down the road. But first, let's talk about just the concept. Okay, Take a look here at this next slide. We've got, for example, a point on a demand curve shown here on the graph. Price of $9, quantity purchased is 12 Suppose the price were to drop to $6 and the quantity purchased increased to 15 units. Those are two points on a demand curve. You connect them, extend the line, and what do you see? You see a fairly, fairly steep demand curve. We'll call it demand curve number one. Okay. What happened? Well, that's a pretty good price drop. Nine dollars all the way down to six dollars. But it sure didn't motivate people to buy a whole lot more of the product. And if you turn it around, when you raise the price, it didn't buy a whole lot less. Let's look at another option here. What if, in fact, when the price drops to $6, people buy 30 units, not 15? Well, now you've got a, a different shape to the demand curve, a different slope. De demand curve number two is much flatter, what we will call more elastic. The steeper curve, D1, we'll call more inelastic. Note that on D1, price did not make a big difference to the buyers. Even though it was significantly cheaper, they didn't buy a whole lot more. But for D2, whatever product that might be, that decrease in price prompted a large response by the buyers. Buyers were very sensitive to the price, and they increased their purchases from 12 units to 30 units. So these are two curves with different elasticities, and that's the idea of where we're going with this stuff. Again, D2 is an elastic curve. D1 is a more inelastic curve. Hang with me on those terms. What makes a demand curve more or less elastic? There are four factors. The number of substitutes you can find. If you have a lot of substitutes, a little price change makes you go buy something else. More substitutes, more elastic demand. Second, if you have a lot of time to search and, and shop, then 
you're sensitive to the price changes because you go look somewhere else. You go find another option to buy. You have time to do that. On the other hand, if you need something and you need it really bad right now, you might be willing to pay a higher price. Your demand, we would say, is more inelastic. What else? The amount of your income or budget that you're going to spend on a given product. If you're going to buy a car, for example, and the price goes up by 5%, that's a lot of money. And that may make your demand very sensitive to price or more elastic. On the other hand, if you're just going to go down and buy a box of toothpicks uh, and it goes from $1.15 up to $1.39 in price, that's such a small amount of your budget, you probably won't even notice it. And you'll buy as many toothpicks as you think you need anyway. So when we're talking large dollar amounts or a large percentage of your budget, your demand tends to be more elastic. And then finally, the degree to which a good or service is a necessity will have a big impact on whether or not demand is elastic or inelastic. Goods that we call luxuries, things you don't really have to have, well, you tend to be more sensitive to prices. If the price goes up, you say, well, I didn't need it anyway. Whereas if it's a necessity and the price goes up, what do you say? Eh, I hate to pay for it, but I'm going to buy it. So when you have luxuries, you have more elastic demand. When you have necessities, you have a more inelastic demand. Once again, let's take a quick look here. Look at this demand curve and note that when the price falls from $3.10 down to $3, people dramatically increase their purchases. So this is a fairly elastic demand curve. Do you suppose this reflects the demand for liquor, overall, all liquor, or just for Miller beer? What do you think? Think of it the other way. Suppose this is the price of a drink and it, or a beer, and it goes from $3 to $3.10, and as a result, sales drop from 85 down to 6 units. Are we describing the behavior of liquor or beer? Miller beer. And I would tell you the answer is Miller beer, because if the price of Miller beer goes up, how many substitutes are there for that? Quite a few. But if the price of all liquor goes up, there's not a whole lot of substitutes available. Let's try another example real quick. Look here. We have a price change from 50 cents up to $9. Huge price increase, but we see that people keep buying almost as much as they did anyway. Do you suppose this reflects the demand for insulin, a necessary medicine for a diabetic, or is this a demand curve for potato chips? Well, how many substitutes do you know for insulin? How about for potato chips? Is it clear to you that this would be the demand curve for insulin? got to have it regardless of the price. So I hope we made it clear, at least conceptually, what elastic and inelastic demand is talking about. From here we'll get on into some more uh, quantitative measurements and a lot more information.